Jesus was mad. I don't know if you noticed in that, but like Jesus was just mad at his disciples. And then, and then he called them perverse. And then, and then Jesus said, how long do I even have to stay with you? Like he was just kind of ticked off. Why? Because they didn't have enough faith. And Jesus is like, look, you could do what I did because he just he, he, he was the source of this miraculous healing. He, he's saying, you could do that if you had enough faith. And they asked him, just like we'd ask him, well, how do we, how do we get that faith? I don't know I, how often you wonder if, if you're a Christian person, and some people here might, might be just visiting or curious, but if you're a Christian person, I don't know how often you've asked of yourself, what is the power of the faith, faith that I have, and what real difference can it make in my life? In your Bibles, I want to look at Hebrews 11. If you're at home and you have a Bible, you can open it up to Hebrews 11. And the one thing that we get right away when we look at a faith chapter uh, in, in the Bible, and there are many passages in, in the Bible, as you can imagine, that deal with faith. But the thing that we get right away is that faith is not a theoretical thing. Faith is something that becomes lived out and real in people's lives in a profound way. It doesn't change just them, it changes the community around them. And at the beginning of that chapter in Hebrews 11, the writer begins by giving a really simple definition of faith. And I say simple, it's a bit hard to understand out of context, but here it is. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, when I first read that, I'm like, I'm not really sure what that means. It's kind of poetic, but I really don't, I really don't get it. And, we might, and then the writer says, okay, that, that's how the, the chapter 11 in Hebrews begins with that verse. And people read it and they say, I really don't get that. It's not that profound. It doesn't mean anything to me. So the writer says, okay, I'll show you what I mean. And the whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is story after story after story of different people who had faith. And in that, the power of that faith, they changed the world around them. And we see in Hebrews 11 that there has to be a story attached to your faith. It's not just a theoretical thing. It's something that makes a difference in real ways that even people who aren't of people of faith can see around you. Huge differences when you practice faith. I can give you an example of, of what faith looks like here in this church, and you all know this. I've been here for 22 and a half years. We have met our budget every single year that I've been at this church, and, and that happened before I came. That's practiced faith. That, that, you, you all have faith, but that is evidence of your faith, that there is something real that happens that makes a real difference in the world. Our community supper has been going for 14 years. We ask for food, people give us food. In COVID, when times were, were, were the hardest, we started Love Your Neighbor initiative. People gave to love your neighbor. You see, it's not just that you have faith. It's, it's there is action following the, the confession of faith that makes a real difference in the lives of people. There has to be stories attached to faith. Because if somebody says, I have faith, then the person they're speaking with would then say, What's the, tell me a story. Tell me a story about, about the difference that your faith made in somebody's life. And now you all are welcoming Jessica into this church as the director of children and youth ministries. I mean, that's a statement of faith. You have the faith that something can happen. And here's your action. You are welcoming her. You are believing in what she can do in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is an action. I have faith this can happen. But now I'm going to publicly do things to welcome her and to help her and to make that happen in hands-on and awesome ways. This church has practiced their faith so that it's evident to people, so that when people walk by these doors down Maple Street, and down, every time somebody walks by, they go, that's the church that helps people. That's the church that's been a light to the community. And as we go through Hebrews 11, it's just stories of what people have done in the power of their faith. So that when somebody who knows nothing about Jesus looks at these stories about faith, they can see what faith really is and what faith really does. It's not just theoretical. There's all these incredible examples in Hebrews 11, and we'll read through these. 
And as we read through these, if you're like me, you'll be thinking, I, I want to be that. I want to be that person who did something really significant because I had faith in Jesus. I don't want to just be, I don't want to be tepid. I don't want to be average. As, as you go through some of these that we'll go through, just, I don't, that's, that's how I think. I don't know if you would, but I want to be that person who just makes a, makes a difference in the world as we go through these stories. And another thing that we learn as we go through any faith story in the Bible is that what God did then, listen, what God did then, God can do now. What God did through them, God can do through us now. It's like the creation story in Genesis 1. God created the heavens and the earth. It's an incredible story of a power that is benevolent, that created everything around us. But if you miss the point that God is creator and that God still creates in, in our lives today, you're missing the point of Genesis 1. God didn't just create, God still creates in this church, in each one of us. So I just want to draw your attention to some of these, some of these verses from Hebrews 11. We'll start at verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the waters of the Red Sea. You know that story. You talk about something powerful. It's kind of like, I want to do something like that that is a result of my faith. Moses had faith. Aaron had faith. The people had faith. What did they do? They, they escaped Egypt, and they crossed the parted waters of the Red Sea. Amazing. This church can do something like that. And Jesus is like, if it just had enough faith... I don't want Jesus to be frustrated with us like he was frustrated with his disciples. Why do I even stay around, Jesus said. If you just had enough faith, you could walk through the parted waters of the Red Sea. How does that work, Jesus? He goes on, by faith, or by faith the wall of Jericho fell after the army mar marched around them for seven days. You know that story. about. That's a pretty amazing story. Can you imagine the walls of Jericho falling? That was because of faith, the writer said. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. I want to draw your attention to this, because Rahab was, was, was a, outside of the circle. She was a prostitute. She was an outcast. But yet, she's listed in Hebrews 11 as being a hero of faith. So if you've, you've ever thought to yourself, I've made too many mistakes, I'm too average, I'm too, or whatever, God's not going to use me to be a hero of faith. No. You, you can't justify that when there are examples of people who are not here. They're way down here. And because of something they do, God uses them to be heroes of faith. Verse 32 goes on. The Hebrew writer goes on to say, and what more can I say? He said, I'm pretty much, I'm, I'm, I've made my point. And when any, whenever any preacher says, what more can I say? I'm going to wrap it up now. That doesn't, it means they're going to go on and on and on. I'm, I'm finished now, last thing I'm going to, never, and he goes on, listen to this, I don't have time to tell you, I love that, I don't have time, now, what he's saying is this is really important, what I want to try to communicate to you about the power of faith is really important, but I don't have time, do you know why he doesn't have time, because the list of people is too long, it would take him a lifetime to list all of God's people who did amazing things through the power of faith. But he lists a few. Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. About David, I don't have time to tell you about David. There are all kinds of stories about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms. This is what they did. Listen, this is what we can do. See, see, Genesis is about what God created then, God can create now, what the Holy Spirit created. What God did then, God can do now. What God did through them, God can do. Yeah, this is what we could do. They conquered kingdoms. They administered justice. They gained what was promised. We come here and we listen to promises that God makes through the words of Scripture and we're like, wouldn't it be amazing if that promise came true in this church? They gained what was promised through faith. They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the fury of the flames. He's just writing, I really don't have time for this, but I'm just... <laughs> they escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness turned to strength. Man. And the writer is like, don't miss this, don't miss this. It's all because of faith. 
And Jesus was so frustrated with his disciples because he thought they'd have faith and for whatever reason they didn't. Why am I even sticking around with you guys, Jesus said to them. There's example after example of God doing the, this incredible work through people. And we hear these stories, we're kind of like, that's kind of what we want. Can you, can, can you imagine what this community of faith would be like with some of this stuff happening? And some of this stuff has happened here, hasn't it? Over the years. But imagine conquering kingdoms. Example after example after. I don't have time. It's not that this is important. It's not that I have to go do. It's just that the, the list is just too long, the writer of Hebrews says. When this passage is preached on, this is where it ends usually. But there's another verse. There's another group of people. There are different heroes of faith that often are not preached on because it's harder. We could label the people of faith that we've just talked about, the people that accomplish great things, we could label them group one, but there is another group of people that had the same faith we could label group two. And it starts with verse 35, simple. There were others. Here's all the people that did amazing things through faith, and we celebrate that, and that's what Jesus wanted. But there's another group of people with the same faith. There were others who were tortured. They refused to be released that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging. It's the same faith. These people had the same faith, but there was a different outcome. Some had, uh, were put in chains and they were imprisoned. Some were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins. It's the same faith, with a whole different outcome. But I want to conquer kingdoms. I want to administer justice. I want to have, like, I want to have people coming into this church and discovering the, the, the love of God. I want, to have kids. I want young families to discover who God... It's a whole different outcome. These are people that had the, had the same faith. They wandered, living in caves and holes in the ground. It takes a turn here. We begin by reading all these incredible examples of people who accomplished the impossible through faith, but now we're reading about people who endured the unimaginable. And it's separated by this very simple verse, there were others. Now here's what I know. And I know because I'm like this, and I know because most of us are like this, no one's going to sign up for group two. We want to sign up for the group that conquers kingdoms. We want to sign up for the group that is able to walk through the parted waters of the Red Sea, and the Egyptians can see the power of our God through our success. Who's going to sign up to be part of group two? But often we find ourselves in group two. If we are men and women of faith, we will find ourselves from time to time in group two, practicing the same faith, but then being in incredibly difficult situations. There will be times when God seems to be accomplishing things that you can never imagine, and we celebrate that in worship, but there will be other times when you will be enduring things that you'd never thought you'd have to endure, and you think, what's, what's the difference? It's the same faith. Why am I going through these things that I'm going through when I, when I hear words of the power of faith that changes people's lives? I think one of the challenges for many of us, is that when we think about faith, we think of this power, this article that we can use in our lives just to get God to do what we want God to do. I think that's, and that's preached. That's preached in churches. It's called reward theology. It's called name it and claim it theology. If you just had enough faith. Now, they twist it around, you see, because that's what Jesus said too. If you just had enough faith. But it becomes distorted when the message is, if you just had enough faith, you're going to get all of these things that you think you, you, you need. 
You're going to have a nice house. You're going to get the relationship you wanted, the career, your finances, all of that stuff you're going to get. Be very careful about that teaching. I mean, what does verse 37 and following mean? When it lists people killed by the sword. Wait a minute, they had the same faith. They were sawed in two. They lived in caves and holes in the ground. Who's going to sign up to be a part of group two? Is the problem that they didn't have enough faith? Is that why they ended up there instead of here? No, it's not. That's not the problem. They had faith. What their faith gave them was the strength to endure the things they had to endure. What their, strength, their faith gave them is, is, this, is the, the ability to persevere. And that same faith allowed them to put their hope in God rather than in the circumstances of this life. Sometimes our faith heals. Sometimes our faith pays the bills. But sometimes faith gives you the strength to get through when healing doesn't happen. Sometimes faith gives you the strength to persevere when you're not sure how you're going to get paid. There are two different groups here. As a person of faith, you will find yourself in both. And I just, just to finish up, I just want to throw you an anchor. It's just something that comes out of Hebrew, Hebrews 11 that you can hold on to. If you are a person with a deep and, and, and abiding and great faith that is suffering through a difficult time. Let's put this verse up that we started with again. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's a certainty in what we do not see. The word translated as confidence here is really better defined as it's an absolute certainty. It's even stronger than that. It's, what it is is it's saying, it's almost as if what hasn't happened yet, we're, we're speaking about what hasn't happened yet as though it's already happened. I know, bear with me on this. It's kind of, it's hard to understand, but we speak about what hasn't happened yet as though it's already happened. That's what we're talking about with this biblical confidence as it relates to faith. And when you speak of something that has not yet happened, as if it's already happened, you're speaking of the future in the past tense. And I'm just going to give you an example to help us understand. Here it is in Joshua chapter 6. Hebrews 11 made a reference to the Jericho story. This is the story where Moses dies. Uh, the people of Israel are in the desert, and they're just getting ready to go into the promised land. But they, they need a leader because Moses has died. So Joshua is appointed by God to lead the people into the promised land. And the people go into the, the first thing they, they run into as they, as they go into this land that was promised them are the walls of Jericho. Huge, thick, four meter wide walls. It's an impossible situation. They're all like, how are we ever going to get through these walls? And here's what the Lord said to Joshua. I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. And Joshua was like, okay, God, I don't want to get caught up on details like past tense and present tense, but we're on the wrong side of the wall. And God, what you have said to me is, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. We're not there yet. You, it's okay. It's okay, God, because sometimes we get mixed up with our tenses. But I think what you meant to say, God, was I will deliver Jericho into your hands. You just got confused. You're speaking of something in the past tense that hasn't happened yet. And God's like, that's what I do. I speak of things that have not yet happened as though they've already happened. Because I am assuring you that my promises to you will happen even though they haven't yet happened yet. I have delivered. He speaks of something that, haven't ha that hasn't happened as if it's already happened. And in faith, you speak of the future in the past tense. That's how confident you are. It's the same. I know, I know it's hard. Like, it's the same for you. It's the same for this church. It's the same for our family. It's the same for Kimberly and Haven and myself. 
when God told us not long ago that I have delivered you into a good ministry in London. And we're like, no, you haven't. I think what you meant to say, God, was I will deliver you and do a good ministry. And God said, no, I, I, I said what I meant. I said what I meant. It's already done. Don't you understand? I have delivered you. It's already done. You might not know the details yet. And it will be your faith that will allow you to walk forward knowing that I am trustworthy. Listen, there are things in your life that haven't happened yet. And God is saying, I will, God is saying, I have delivered you. He's not using the future tense. He's saying, I have delivered you. And you're like, no, you haven't delivered us yet. And God, you, you don't see the future. You don't see all the details. But God is saying to each one of you, I have delivered you. You don't need to know the details yet. You need to trust me. And this will be the cornerstone of your faith. Because if you really believe that, you will go out and do anything in confidence. I've delivered you. Yeah, but God, it hasn't happened yet. Do you not trust me? Where's your faith? What am I going to do? How long do I have to put up with you? If you just had enough faith, you could do miracles in this world. Yeah, but God, I want to know the details of what you... You don't need to know the details. Just because it hasn't happened yet in your life, I have... It applies to each one of you in a powerful way, and that's the power of our faith. Just last story. When I was eight, nine years old, I lived on a little radar base in the northern tip of Vancouver Island. My dad was a chaplain. It was uh, 400 people. In the Cold War, the, the, the Western world was, were always afraid the Russians would fly over the top, so there were radar bases that lined the north of Canada and the north of Europe. So we were at one of these radar bases, north tip of Vancouver Island, and my mom had made a friend. Now, I don't know if any of you are military or military spouses, but it's a, it's a tough life being a military spouse. It was then anyway, because you move and you just make a friend, but then three years later you have to move. But she had made this friend and they were just, it was magic. Like, they were like sisters, they just connected. She, she was part of our church, so they had, they had a faith component that was common, but they just loved each other. And I remember the morning mom got a call and there had been a boating accident. She had been, her friend had been on a boat, a storm came up, boat capsized, and she had drowned. My mom's friend had drowned. And I remember the service in the chapel. It was a little chapel, as you can imagine, in a little radar base. My dad's chapel wasn't big and, and we crammed in there for this funeral service. And, and as an eight-year-old, I still remember vividly the sadness of that event. And I remember going home and going to my room and coming out of my room about 10 minutes later and I, was, I heard music playing. Well, it was the organ. And I went into the, the living room and my mom was, was playing this organ that we had. You know, one of the little organs that every... every Every other house had one of those little two-tiered in the 70s, you know, those, you can't give them away now, but everybody had, and she was sitting at this organ playing and singing. This was like 20 minutes after the funeral ended. And she was singing the chorus to Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And I recognized the tune because I had sang it in church, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am old, I am tired, I am worn. And I was absolutely transfixed as I stood on the side of the, the living room while she was on the other playing and singing because I didn't know what to do with that, even as an eight-year-old. I didn't know what to do with someone who was heartbroken, someone who had tears streaming down her cheeks, and they're singing through the storm, through the night, lead me. God, continue to lead me. But even then, I knew what it was. I knew it was faith. It's faith. Faith is not dictated by our circumstances, by the circumstances we live in. 
And maybe some might think it's not faith, it's just denial. People are in denial of bad things. It's not denial, it's certainty. It's certainty. We know how the story goes. We speak of the future in a way where God says, I've already delivered you. I've already delivered it. And somehow this faith that, that even in, 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 the, in, in the midst of a broken heart, there are people who know that God's delivered. You find yourselves in group one. This church has been in group one for many years. We've done lots of group one stuff. We've accomplished amazing things here. But there will be times when we find ourselves in group two among the others. And then there were others. We'll be among the others. And it's not because we lack faith. And we are reminded that our faith is an absolute certainty. Our faith is not in the circumstances of this life, but in the character of God who has promised us more than we can yet imagine. This is the future of this church. This is the future of this church.